Hi, Ophir Duan. Where are you? I'm in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And you are uh, one of our the National Michael Chekhov Association's newly certified teachers. Yes. Yes, and I'm proud. <laughs> yeah. And I understand that you have some questions uh, for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, um, uh, and um, so I'm going to invite you to go ahead. And what's today? Today is August. What is okay. it? August tenth, twenty eighteen. Yes. Um, and I'm Lisa Dalton, president of the National Michael Chekhov Association. So, uh, so Ophir, go for it. So my question or my interest is, uh, is um, I hear from a bit here and there uh, about Jacobin. Um, actually, I, I, I was, you know, Googling and I was going to YouTube and uh, I saw him at the Incredible Hulk. And there is something in him that is very fresh, if you see it now, very, very well <laughs> acted. Um, but this is only just something that I did, but I want to know what's his role, uh, in the Chekhov, you know, uh, tradition, what I thought that maybe he wrote something about the work. Um, I couldn't find anything. Um, and I want to know more about him. Um, great. Great. So first of all, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, his performance in The Incredible Hulk and, and fascinated that you made that observation because I feel like that is one of the special, unique things that happens with a real uh, Chekhov-based actor. I feel the same way when I look at his own Oscar-nominated performance in Spellbound, Mr. Chekhov's um, and I feel the same uh, of Beatrice Strait, another one of my teachers, um, of her Oscar-winning performance in Network. And so, uh, and I, and I think, you know, in many ways that uh, that this is kind of a hallmark. In fact, Jack used to say, when you look at someone like Clint Eastwood, and you look at Marilyn Monroe, and you look at um, you know, Beatrice Strait and ask, you know, what, or Clint Eastwood, what, what makes these people, James Dean, what makes these people notably Chekhov? I mean, they're very distinct kind of actors. And Jack said, it's, they're very much in their physical form. They're very much in their body. The work, no matter what medium, uh, whether it's long shot or close up, their work, the entire being is fully engaged. And I wonder myself if that's what makes what is, you know, a performance that's in a movie that now looks like style, like, you know, all the other actors in Spellbound look stylized, all the other actors in, uh, in, in Network look stylized. William Holden, Faye Dunaway, it looks like a period yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. film. And yet Beatrice's performance feels as fresh and human. And, and so the, um, you know, I think that's a real gift. Jack's uh, position, first let me share, in his uh, fundamental relationship with Michael Chekhov is uh, based in the fact that Jack himself was a certified genius, only he wouldn't say that. He, huh. he would say he was a certified idiot savant. Um, those, those were the words he more commonly used than genius. And he explained that at, by the age of 12, he was um, under the guidance of some psychologists from UCLA, mm. who brought him around to soirees and salons and to gatherings of brilliant people and present him 
as this amazing psychological phenomenon because he couldn't add two plus two at the age of 12. But he could quote Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, the Bible, Spinoza, didn't matter, he could quote them. And so he had this extraordinary mind and that mind was uh, paraded around in, in social spheres. And that mind um, saw Michael Chekhov's front. He found out about Michael Chekhov and he became intent upon connecting with Michael Chekhov. And he managed to do so when he was 16. And he had no money. To, to speak of. And so he became, this is the, the word he used, he became Mr. and Mrs. Chekhov's houseboy. Wow. And um, so Mr. Chekhov had a heart attack um, in, uh, in, I think it was late 49. And then um, it, it it was, uh, and so following that, he needed, Mr. Chekhov needed to go for walks and he needed help around the house and she needed help around the house. And so uh, Jack would speak to Mr. Chekhov. Uh, and as far as I know, everybody called him Mr. Chekhov except for Mala Powers, who, who called him Big Pixie. And Mr. Chekhov called her Little Pixie. <laughs> um, and um, Pixie. well, pixies are small, and okay. and Mr. Chekhov was small. I mean, he was about five six, but a little curl curved over, so they were probably about the same height, around five four, five five. And um, so, it, Jack um, Jack shared many stories with me about how um, he and Mr. Chekhov went on peripatetic walks. So these are walks that, uh, where they would just talk about all this philosophy and things mm -hmm. like that. And we know, for example, in Michael Chekhov's autobiography, he talks about how his father locked him the two of them into a room for three days with just vodka, no food. And yeah, yeah they talked about Spinoza and Aristotle and Plato and, and all those. So we know Mr. Chekhov was very, very well versed in that. And Jack, and if we talk in terms of the thinking dominated person, uh, being a genius level on that part of his brain, uh, loved to talk about the philosophy of the art. And Jack was an artist. He was a sculptor and a painter. Oh. Okay. Yes. So he was very hands-on with his, uh, his work. And his primary lens in describing things came through art. Uh, so he was an ardent studier of art. And he was a wonderful artist himself. I didn't know that. Yeah, and he and Mr. Chekhov shared that, you know, that they, they both really loved art. And so with that in mind, um, uh, well, let me share you just a, a little anecdote that Jack would tell that characterized Mr. Chekhov's uh, humor. Mr. Chekhov had quite a sense of humor. Um, so, Mr. Chekhov was not happy about having to walk with a cane when he was recovering from his heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so he would not use a cane. Ms. Mala actually inherited a bunch of his canes. But Jack was taking him on a walk. And the, uh, Mr. Chekhov lived on a street called San Ysidro, Y-S-I-R-R. Uh, Y-S-I-D-R-O, in Bel Air, in Cal Beverly Hills, California. Mm -hmm. And it was on a hill. It was a small, modest house, um, but it was on a hill. And so instead of walking on the hill, Jack would drive him down to the, a flat 
uh, little park that was kind of a triangle on Sunset Boulevard, Beverly, Beverly Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard around there. Uh, and they would walk around the park and he would not take his cane. He would take an umbrella with a handle on it. And Jack said, Mr. Chekhov, you know, it's, it's not going to rain. Why are you taking an umbrella? And Mr. Chekhov said, well, when you walk with a cane, everyone looks at you and says, oh, poor old man, poor old man. But when you walk with an umbrella, everybody looks up. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> so, uh, so, a wonderful little story. Um, so Jack um, told many stories also because he was he would sometimes get to sit in on the coaching sessions and he was frequently there when Marilyn Monroe was uh, coming and going and other famous stars were coming and going from the house and um, would and you know would share various stories about that. Mm -hmm. um, the way that Jack and I met was that uh, one day my phone rang and it was in 1993, um, the winter of 1993. And Jack said, uh, and this voice on the other side said, uh, this is Jack Colvin, who are you? <laughs> and I was like, um, I'm... Lisa Dalton, and he says, so I've got this flyer here that says you're teaching Michael Chekhov. I, I was like, uh, yes. He goes, well, I study with Michael Chekhov. Who, who are you? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, why don't we get together and talk about this? I'd love to meet you. <laughs> you, Mala? He had met Mala, you know, back in okay during the day, but he never knew her personally. You know, he'd been in class with Mala, and he didn't know about the connection you and Mala had. Correct. Okay. okay. Correct, because uh, in addition to teaching together, I had my own studio, my own okay uh, classes. Mala and I taught together, um, and and I had my own separate classes. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we went to lunch in Glendale, California. He took me to lunch. He picked a place, and um, uh, and we had a four or five hour lunch together, and just sort of fell in love with each other. Uh, he. He became aware of the depth of my research and knowledge and the uh, amount of training study application that I had done and the, my travels to the uh, first and second uh, international workshops, first in Berlin in 92, uh, hosted by Jörg Andres and Joost Langhans, and, uh, and then the following year in Moscow. And we were gearing up for coming to England uh, in 1994 uh, for Sarah Kane uh, mm -hmm. directing that. And I was on the organizing body of, uh, of this. So as part of the team that helped Sarah create these events uh, as I was also in, in um, Moscow and um, in the following year, 95, when we went back to Berlin. So, um, I, in my capacity as on the organizing committee, I was asked to identify anyone who had worked with Michael Chekhov and arrange to invite them to England. Okay. And so that is where I, uh, so I began working on Jack to get Jack to come. And Jack had just come off of a period of time where he had lost his parents, both parents, and had inherited their home in Silver Lake. Uh, 
as an area of Los Angeles. And that home was high up. Uh, there was actually like a three flights of stairs or so up to his house, the house. Okay. And there was a separate home on the street level, which was also part of that property. And, and in which some of his uh, students lived, one, one in particular lived. And um, Jack explained to me that in um, around 1990, well, prior to that, for years, he had worked with a theater company in the Valley. And he would, uh, it was a large cooperative company, and he would um, sit in on the scenes, and then he would talk and he would share information about uh, the perspectives from Chekhov's work. And eventually he split off from that and, and a group of the actors from there were so fascinated by his work that they joined him. Yeah. And in 8990, they incorporated as Nova Diem, New Day, Nova Diem Theater Company. And, um, and at, with Jack at the lead of that. And they produced about five very successful productions and uh, got their uh, nonprofit status. And, um, and then he went through the elder care process of taking his parents one at a time across the threshold. And during that time, essentially did not have the ability, the capacity to keep the theater company going uh, with productions. And he had more or less become a recluse. And um, so they had now uh, this nonprofit, you know, this legal nonprofit status, which took a lot of effort for them to gain. And yet the company itself was basically defunct and and Jack basically wasn't going out of his house. So some of them um, were continuing to come to his house and converse and chat. And as I said, one of them lived on his property. And so uh, I was working on getting Jack to come to England, uh, August of 94. And with that, we... Um, we thought, and Jack agreed, it would be really the first time he'd spent away overnight for several years from his home. And he, and, and we thought it might be helpful to try and raise some additional funds to bring a group of actors to England and support them by raising funds. To this effort, we reconvened Nova Diem and, hel and held a, um, a membership meeting where Nova Diem voted Mala Powers and myself in as full members and gave us the support. And we began having gatherings of Nova Diem and, and we applied to a bunch of grants. None of the grants came through, um, but, but our, we, we brought a team of actors to England and there were about six of us and Jack had taught me a technique that he and he said he told me he and Mr. Chekhov were working on um, before he died that he had not yet introduced to the world. Mm -hmm. And that technique had to do with the conditions of equilibrium and the human being's relationship to the law of gravity. And, and what we decided to do was bring a performance to England. And we had a series of short plays. And in that series of short plays, um, I directed some of them and Jack directed me and himself in a, uh, a scene from um, Neil Simon's The Good Doctor, which is based on Anton Chekhov, 
stories. Uh And we did the scene called the audition where you have the uh, author director and the actress. And so Jack played the male role and I played the actress and Jack directed me using only these three relationships to equilibrium, yielding to it, giving in to it, which he called falling, and fighting it, struggling with it, which he called balancing, and being free of it. Floating is what he called it, floating weightlessly. And I was to use no other images. He forbid me to go back um, and read the three sisters, which the final monologue of the scene is drawn from. He did not want me studying any characterization, doing any research whatsoever, just purely these three. And, uh, And so we did present that in England. And at the conclusion of it, we had, uh, uh, or the next day, we had a big talk back, uh, and Frank Chamberlain, who was a, is a British scholar, uh, really nice guy, um, he, uh, I think he was the one who, who led the question, somebody anyway asked, what do we call this new set of tools? And, uh, and he said, well, we have the four brothers and you did the exercise and you showed us what they were using the three sisters. So why don't we call them the three sister sensations? And that's how they got baptized, the three sister sensations. So it was Frank Chamberlain who got up, but we came up with the name. Yes. And he talks about <laughs> it. He talks about it in his book. Um, mm-hmm book on Michael Chekhov. Um, I, I wanted to buy it, but I, I heard that he's putting out another edition. And actually you can, um, you can see this part of this show, part of this, uh, you know, a show or presentation in YouTube, right? That's correct. That, yeah. that is on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you know, I started um, carrying around my video camera to document these things starting in 1991, where I uh, produced the 100th birthday salute to Michael Chekhov at the American Film Institute in Hollywood um, in, um, uh, in conjunction with the Screen Actors Guild Conservatory. So I had Beatrice Strait there and Mala Powers and Ford Rainey, who was part of the Chekhov Theater Players. He's the one who played King Lear in that, those famous pictures of the Ridgefield group mm. and um, it worked quite a bit and actually uh, was a student in a number of my classes. <laughs> uh, and uh, Ford joined us in Nova Diem in our gatherings with Nova Diem also. And sometimes Daphne Field, who was the youngest member of the Dartington Hall group and Mary Lou Taylor. Who was um, who played Cordelia alternately with Daphne in in that um, production of King Lear, and I was able for this ninety four conference to invite um, of great significance here is the fact that I invited Joanna Merlin and introduced Joanna Merlin into this whole group of international Chekhov fans, and also David Zinder. Uh, so I was able to invite him into this mix and invite him to teach. Uh, he told me that you were going, uh, that you were filming everything. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I have perhaps the world's largest collection of video footage on the subject of Michael Chekhov. <laughs> and parts of that are seen in, um, uh, in From Russia to Hollywood, the, the first documentary made on Michael Chekhov. There's also about a third of the footage in uh, Michael Chekhov, The Darlington Years, uh, out of England by Martin Sharp, and also um, the Planeta 4 Russian documentary contains quite a bit of my footage. And I have um, an interview that I had uh, Mala Powers do of Jack, 
Um, and it would be really cool to be able to get that available in the same way I have the um, Anthony Quinn yeah. interview uh, mm -hmm. available. I, I would like to actually release uh, a whole series of those individual uh, interviews. That would be a cool thing to have happen for. Yeah. I think it's important. It is. It is. So uh, time and resources, maybe some sort of Indiegogo campaign to help cover uh, an editor and, and all the costs. Something interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jack, um, Jack and I came back from uh, England very excited and very enthusiastic about the whole impulse. And Jack and I decided that we would ask Nova Diem members uh, if, if they would be okay with us changing the name of Nova Diem to the Michael Chekhov Studio USA West. Mm. And they were in support of it. They were not active in, in it for much, but in um, 1996, it was finally all legalized and all accepted uh, by the government. And we, and we established the Michael Chekhov studio formally there. And I became president of it. Jack did not want to hold an office. Mala Powers was the vice president. So um, I was gifted the use of a barn that had been converted into a loft and studios uh, by an anthroposophical voice teacher of mine named Odessa Ferris. And interestingly, the barn was built in the same year that Mr. Chekhov opened the Chekhov Theater Barn at Dartington. Oh, wow. So that's just kind of an interesting coincidence. And we were in the, in the Chekhov barn there. And for the next six years, um, Jack attended most of my classes. And Jack and I spent... a probably an average of about 20 hours a week together. And he mentored me very, very closely about how I was teaching. And we spoke at length uh, after each class about each student and their, uh, their progression and talked about how to mentor them most effectively. And I created uh, and and when I would travel, Jack would take my classes. And I also, from 96 to 98, taught every weekend down in San Diego. So we had the Michael Chekhov Studio San Diego portion. And Jack would go down to San Diego and teach for me when I was not available. Oh, wow. You worked, I mean, actually together? Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. yes. Oh, and I didn't know that much. Yes. Okay. Yes, and most people are unaware of how close we were. Mm. We spoke almost every day, and our conversations were rarely less than two hours. And, uh, and, and we spoke of, of everything, uh, of, of the arts and the concepts and all these anecdotes and stories and, and how, to, uh, you know, to how to weave things together. And... Uh, bring them forward in the classes. Hmm. And uh, he himself, uh, as a person, was extremely vulnerable. In, if one could say he was a thinking-dominated person, if we were looking at it from a Chekhov perspective, he, he was thinking-dominated because he had this very high level of, of personal vulnerability and a high level of anxiety uh, in that vulnerability. And so he was a chain smoker and he literally lit one cigarette off, off of another. And, um, uh, and he, when I wanted him to teach, I wanted him to teach an advanced class. He uh, was too nervous. And after each class that we, that he would substitute for me, we would, we would spend even more time um, talking about what he did step by step, what he talked about and how it went. Um, and he had to hear from me 
how each person responded to it. Mm. Um, because he was, he was very vulnerable and scared that he didn't do well. And, uh, and the big thing that uh, would come back from students was that he talked a lot. And of course he was an incredible raconteur. He was an amazing storyteller and he was brilliant. So he would, you know, take them through, through fascinating things, but it was very talky oriented and often the class would go by and no one ever got up. Um, <laughs> so I would have to encourage him to, you know, follow some of the structure that, that he would you know work with me on and and of note here also is in his mentorship of me was uh when i would teach the three sister sensations we talked a great great length and i argued with him over whether f floating yeah, i remember this uh, yeah. yeah was rising yeah and I wanted it to be rising because we already had floating and molding, flowing, flying, radiating, flowing, floating. If there was enough confusion yeah. about how the element of water as a quality of movement, as a kind of movement, was mm -hmm. already confusing. And to bring another use of the word floating in, I was intellectually resistant to. And so uh, I taught it, um, for example, in in um, uh, 1998, uh, where I brought the first international workshop to the United States, and in 1999, I taught it at these two workshops um, as rising. <laughs> and so you will still see in the canon, you know, the Misha organization is a carry on from those two workshops that I created um, where at the end of which I asked uh, Joanna to please take over the organization because I had the Michael Chekhov Studio USA West and I had the National Michael Chekhov Association and I was actually making a living as an actor. I couldn't manage, you know, a, a family life, a career as an actor and, and running a third uh, event, especially without internet and without, uh, you know, uh, with that, but yeah, it was very, very difficult. So, um, thank God she and Jessica Cerullo took that uh, up and um, very grateful for, for that work that continued. But when you go to uh, classes where people who learned it through me are teaching it, they may use the term rising. And Jack's objection to my use of that term was that it's directional. And yeah. when you remove gravity, you don't really have direction. Mm. And you, it, rising is, is one aspect of yeah. floating. It's, it's yeah. just one aspect. Yeah. Um, because you can float sideways, you know, and, and you can float in really any direction when there's, yeah. no, there's no sort of up and down, uh, like an astronaut. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, that, uh, so he, he finally did convince me that I was limiting the potential applications by making it into a directional thing because he also said falling is not directional. Falling is yielding to gravity, but we have gravity on the moon. I mean, we feel that in the tides, the, the um, uh, gravity pulls the tide uh, and so we can feel, you know, gravity comes from different directions. And he said, and frankly, Lisa, my dear, you have, uh, I've seen you fall up the stairs plenty of times. So <laughs> that is, <laughs> we fall in love, we fall asleep, we fall up the stairs, um, we fall to the side, things fall to the side. So it's not always just down, it's rising or floating is not just up. And uh, he did ultimately convince me of that. And I apologize for sharing it wrong. <laughs> but uh, that was Jack's commitment really to wanting to develop or contribute to the pedagogy, the Chekhov pedagogy that was moving into the world. Um, there were a, a couple of exercises that Jack uh, loved to do. One is called the creature. 
and it begins with uh, everybody sort of lying on the floor, guided through a process of sort of emerging from the primordial stew, if you will, and with, with your eyes closed, you don't even have eyes yet, um, finding, connecting with each other until the entire ensemble is able to, to be, you know, molding, moving at, with no eyes as a unit uh, up into, you know, sort of the evolution of humanity, mm. um, creating this ensemble trust, all, you know, all sorts of uh, different kinds of uh, qualities in Michael Chekhov's. So um, that uh, that's a really fun exercise. And um, and he loved to work on the archetypal gestures, which he himself did with an incredible extreme amount of tension. Um, and uh, and uh, he and I would <laughs> debate over whether Gather uh, was a, a true archetype. He said it wasn't, it was a version of pull. And, you know, and I, I would say, well, you know, Jack, there were hunters and gatherers. We didn't really call them pullers, oh. um, <laughs> you know. And uh, and so I don't know, you know, what do we get? I get something different from gather uh, as an archetype. So we would play back and forth with that. Um, and I and I asked him about the teaching process of um, of the gestures, and for him. Um, uh, he described that when Ms. by the time Mr. Chekhov was in Hollywood, he wasn't giving a specific form, that he gave a list of criteria. And that criteria, uh, the list that Jack gave, is what has in NMCA pedagogy is the beep. It's the, the use of one single breath. 100, you know, 100% of the body, 100% effort, uh, going through the extreme polarities that is prepared, acted, and sustained, and then stopped. He, he said that it came from Chekhov, or he, it was his... Um... He, he said Mr. Chekhov gave him these as the criteria, like if you were doing a gesture, an archetypal okay. gesture, and it wasn't in our language, we could say if it wasn't successfully awakening the urge to push, pull, lift, um, then you need to ask yourself these five basic questions. Is it, am I using 100% of my body, 100% uh, of my effort? Am I using... Like and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. To do an effective gesture. To do an effective gesture. And uh, of course, I had learned the gestures um, uh, beginning with Ted and uh, in the early 80s when we started working together and, uh, and then th from um, the Dartington ladies, from Beatrice and from Deirdre and from uh, Eleanor Faze and Felicity Mason, um, Herd Hatfield and uh, all those, those uh, early people and Eddie Grove, who actually trained in, in Los Angeles, another one of uh, Ted's influences. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so from them, I was more or less uh, arrived at that there is an ideal form. Your foot goes here, you, you, you go into the backspace, you move this way, uh, you know, you this way, all these specifics of form. And my experience of merging all these, you know, a dozen direct students that I had of Mr. Chekhov, including George Stanoff, um, uh, who also sort of supported the Dartington form, um, that I, I now had studied with people from Dartington in, you know, 1935, all, you know, before Dartington started, right, Deirdre and Beatrice, all the way through till his death in 1955. So 20 years of development of changes in locations, three different changes and three different functions of what he was trying to teach, who he was trying to teach. 
and therefore changing how he was teaching, that by the time, and Jack said, by the time he got to Hollywood, that he was, he didn't have the time to get picky about the form. He needed everyone to develop the ability to create their own unique form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he was just offering these guidelines. For yeah. me, when I looked back at these specific forms that I was given, I could see where all those guidelines are. I, I can see, for me, if I employ Jack's guidelines, the beep, as we at NMCA call it, um, I wind up with the Dartington forms. Mm. Uh, so, the, you know, we learn, as a, as a teacher, we learn a couple of things. One, there's no right and wrong. Uh, and regarding the archetypal gestures, it's important to really understand that Chekhov left no single definitive list as yeah. to what they are. And I can identify three separate places where he has lists, and they're not the same by any means. Mm. And I've got, you know, 12 direct teachers who talked about these with me, and, and they're not the same. So... Uh, you know, how, how I've adapted those is basically by trying to go into what is the depth of, a, of an archetype. And so for that, I use something Jack also taught me. Um, so Jack spoke about the distinction between an archetype, a prototype, and a stereotype. Mm. And he talked about the archetype in the realm of the ideal. The idea, uh, the, a true archetype is not a visible thing. It's as if it's in a different dimension. Okay. And it's a pure form that is um, whatever it is, whether it's an archetypal character, an archetypal gesture, an archetypal atmosphere, an archetypal event, archetypal story, whatever it is, it's, it's a pure idea, ideal. It's the most yeah. ideal expression, purest expression of that. Yeah. And uh, that when you try to create a physical expression of that ideal, you are creating a prototype. And when you replicate the prototype, you then have stereotypes. So, uh, so the idea of working with archetypal gestures is that we, we, an archetype is that which you know, which you were never taught. It's universal in its essence and it's independent. Uh, it's absolutely independent of the, viewer you know a chair is a chair there is somewhere you know some you know cave person was walking around going uh uh want to sit want to sit and found a stump and that became the first chair you know uh or stool there but there's certain there's a gazillion different kinds of chairs and those are mostly stereotypical chairs and when someone designs a brand new chair, that chair, the first one that's made is the prototype. Mm -hmm. And all of our characters, even if they are like Mr. Chekhov uses on his audio tapes from On Theater and the Art of Acting, um, he uses the uh, archetype of a bitchy woman. Um, that no matter how many times we play a bitchy woman, she has to have the archetype of bitchy woman but she can never become a stereotypical bitchy woman when we go to expression we want to try to create a prototype mm -hmm. uh, so each bitchy woman is somehow its own brand new chair its own brand new bitchy woman and uh, and so jack was very interested in these kinds of concepts and, uh, and so his ability to um, clarify for me where he impacts the NMCA uh, pedagogy uh, is that, uh, that, that I was given all these insights uh, and ways to look at the technique that none of my other teachers gave me. 
And that allowed me to synthesize what all the different interpretations were more easily uh, because I sometimes had conflicting interpretations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is it floating or flowing? You know, am I the mud or am I molding through mud, for example? Yeah. And these kinds of things where, where he helped me to understand the answers, yes, Sometimes you're the sometimes you're you're the brick that someone's trying to you know talking to you is like talking to a brick and sometimes you are the person talking to the brick and you're trying to mold through that or sometimes you are what you are what is molding in a different medium uh, and so these kinds of open really broadening perspectives are something that I have very deeply adopted. And, and a good part of that is inspired by Jack and also by Mala. Uh, the creating the broadest interpretation of anything and accepting all possible interpretations as simply more ways to explore and understand a tool. You know, why limit the toolbox when yeah. you can expand it and, ha and have more and more to play with? Um, so one of... Uh, the great gifts that Jack uh, provided me with was an insight into design. And I did a play that Jorg Andres gave to me. We were hoping Jorg would direct me in it. And it's called Effie's Burning. And Effie's, this, the, there's a video on YouTube of this play, Effie's Burning, of, of my performance of it. So it's a two, two woman show. And it, and, Jorg and I were trying to, you know, have him direct me in it, but it, we couldn't get together from Berlin to uh, Los Angeles. So, um, so Jorg gave me some guidelines on it, and he helped me understand more about the psychology of the stage, um, and um, and that um, uh, uh, and and. So that helped me craft the blocking, but it was um, uh, um, uh, hang on one second. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, uh, one second. Uh, um, um, so uh, so in so I'm directing it myself, and when it came to designing the set, uh, in, in the story is an, a female doctor is getting going through her internship to become a um, plastic surgeon, and uh, and she's been assigned a very very troublesome woman who is mentally. Um, on she, she has the mental she's 67 with the mental capacity of a 13 year old or a 10 year old and so she's in her bed the whole time she's been burned she has set a halfway house on fire and so she's sort of under arrest and in a and and uh and, and nobody understands how she started the fire and she's very difficult to manage so the my mentor doctor hates me wants to push me out of the program so he assigns me this very difficult patient and my character plays about five different characters one half of the stage is effie's room and the other is an empty space in which i play and switch and dialogue with these other characters and jack came i asked him to come and give me some um feedback uh -huh. week before we opened and he watched the play and then in about two minutes he created the design and he said you need a piece of art that has uh, that's black with flame in it and i think i've got one for you you as the doctor should wear a lavender shell under a gray jacket with your white coat over it you should have chrome um, 
clipboard and you should have chrome, small chrome earrings and a chrome watch. And you should wear lavender eyeshadow here. She should have a soft lavender um, uh, robe on. It should be hanging on the side at the start. And, uh, and the lighting over here should have this lavender tint here. And on this side of the stage, you want a yellow and a pink so that uh, it's positioned perfectly so that when you're yourself, you're in pink. And when you turn this way, you're in yellow and it's colder. And we create this coldness on the, in the hospital bedside. And then you've got this sterile part and then this warm part when it's just you, your character speaking. And and then at the at, at the major climax, you bring all this red light, boom, and blah blah blah. And it, it, literally, he just designed the whole thing, and uh, and and that really uh, continued to carry on what I had already been working with on applications for design, and uh, and then I got to. Um, uh, Later, in, in 2004, 2005, I got to direct a production of Of Mice and Men. And I, I videotaped the entire process from the making the agreement with the theater owner and to do the whole thing through checkoff. I videotaped the auditions, videotaped the meetings with the designers, and I got Jack's designer, uh, J. Ken Innesy, from... Uh, who had been the Nova Diem designer, lighting designer. And we created, and because, uh, because Kent already had all of Jack's beautiful inspiration on design, um, I mean, the, the uh, production had several um, nominations for best revival, best actor, and best lighting design, but he won for best lighting design using Michael Chekhov's indications that he had gotten from Jack Colvin. Mm. So um, the, the fact that what Jack had to bring forth was indeed powerful uh, is another element in practical application, uh, another support for why I uh, include a great deal of what I learned from Jack in the work. And I was uh, frustrated that Jack wouldn't teach. And so I created a program we called Courtyard Conversations. So the barn had a beautiful courtyard uh, outside of it. And we would gather on Sunday afternoons and I just turned on a tape recorder and we did about six or seven of these. Well, they're maybe two hours long. So another, another wish list on my to-do thing is to get these lifted and get them uploaded onto the internet so that we can have these podcasts now we call them is, uh, is that is that uh part of the material in the dardington years no those no because he has an interview in the darling dardington years am i correct or am I confusing with uh, From Russia to Hollywood? I think it's From Russia to Hollywood because he wasn't affiliated with the Darlington years. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, the clip in From Russia to Hollywood is from the interview that I had Mala do of him. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's yeah. outside. He's somewhere outside, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, outside. Oh, yeah. You know, well... That, yes, I'm not sure. I had to go back and look at it and see where that, that source is, because, uh, yeah, we yeah. Will, we will see. I, yeah. Later, I will check. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm happy. Uh, apparently, it is on Amazon Prime, uh, From Russia to Hollywood, is on oh. Amazon Prime. So I'm, I want to encourage people to, to watch it. Um, and, and, um, and, and so, ultimately, uh, Jack had a stroke, and uh, when he had a stroke, um, my students gathered together, and we created a, 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 a therapy team 
for Jack. I mean, I spent a lot of time in, in, in the, in, he was in the hospital about a week, I think. And I spent a lot of time with him in the hospital. And then we, when he came out, we created a team of students who uh, shopped for him and helped get him to back and forth to physical therapy and helped him um, regain his ability to speak and, uh, and, and to work. And, and it took about six months, but during that time, when he when it was clear that he was recovering, I convinced him to teach a class, <laughs> his own class. And uh, with that, um, w the idea was uh, I gave him the studio on days I was unavailable. Uh, so let me jump back for a moment. That. Um, uh, uh, actually, I want to pause for one second and get something, okay? Because I want to show it to you. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause the recording as well um, here for a moment. So um, af yeah, after Effie's burning, yeah. Jack presented me with a copy of this sketch. And this sketch... Uh, Jack made of Mr. Chekhov shortly before Mr. Chekhov died. 55. Yes. And uh, he said when he gave it to me that it was a gift to me because he felt that as a teacher, as a director, and as an actor, I had achieved um, you know, a, a certain level of, uh, of mastery and that his presenting this to me was a little bit like his, hmm. was his sort of gift to celebrate my, my achievements in the three areas of teaching, acting and directing with Michael Chekhov's work. It's, it's the same, um, it's the same, how can I say it, the quality of Chekhov's, you know, sketches. Yes, yes. It has a very similar quality. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that was very special um, for me. And he had his stroke, you know, I think it was a week or two after he presented that to me. And so when I, uh, six months later, was able to get him to teach, um, I, I had sort of felt like he'd given me he I I thought I felt when he gave that to me that he felt that he had imparted to me what he really wanted to know me to know mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so the um it, when I you know I gave him the studio I gave it to him on times when I wasn't using it uh, and the reason that those times existed were because they were my times with my husband. And uh, it was Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings. And Tuesday nights, I was with my husband at the American Film Institute, where he and I ran a program where we interviewed casting directors. Mm. Um, and, and so I was busy Tuesday nights. And on Saturday mornings was our time together to play golf. You're talking about Ken. Yes, my husband Ken, Ken Kerman, who who's in uh, the the silent scene on that video from 1994. He he came to uh, England, and uh, one can also see Ken Kerman's um, demo reel using Michael Chekhov's techniques, and on YouTube where uh, I've uh, listed what the techniques are that I coached him with for those roles. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it's, you know, another opportunity there to, to learn more. And, um, and so, uh, I wasn't available to attend those classes and I kind of thought I didn't really need to attend them because he had given me the certificate, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I did was I called up those Nova Diem actors and asked them if they would like to come back and be part of Jack's class and if they would produce it, especially the one who had lived on his property because uh, 
Jack shared with me that he wasn't a very good landlord. So if the young man didn't have the rent, oh, well, you know, so Jack had been very generous, a very generous landlord to this young man. So, you know, I felt this was, would be a, a way for this young man to give back to Jack by producing this and he could do all the organizing for Jack. And so that unfolded and, uh, but it did unfold uh, and I sent Jack all my advanced students because I, again, after some of them had been with me for five years and I felt, you know, they could benefit from Jack's wisdom. And <clears throat> the idea was Jack told me he didn't like teaching the basics. And so the idea was that I would teach all the fundamentals, all the basics. So anybody that came to Jack would already know them mm -hmm. and he would be able to work with them further. So, uh, so that was the policy. And uh, what I, what I um, ultimately forgot, wasn't aware of, didn't understand was the vulnerability that uh, the Jack felt after, each time he taught um, because he a, no longer had the energy to spend 20 hours after each class with me. Yeah. And, um, and I, we couldn't, I couldn't give him the feedback. I couldn't give him the assurance. And that sort of started to separate us. And, uh, and eventually the, um, that the energies, the atmosphere turned and I was, you know, basically he and I in a public sense had to, um, had to seem opposing to each other. Mm. And so that, uh, seemly opposing, I say, because, uh, part of it was, was, you know, picked up from ego and personality struggles with the other people surrounding him immediately and uh and as in a sense that uh there was a uh a, a rising concern about my public spirituality and the that my own tendency to speak publicly about the spiritual nature of michael chekhov and that went against um the the older members the original novadium members it went against their principles Mm -hmm. And they objected to my public spiritual inclusion. Um, and I say, I, and so a, a, on the public level, it looked like there was a major divide. Uh, what many people were not aware of was that, uh, that I would connect with Jack to find out what was going on and why this was happening. And Jack and I would spend two, three, four hours on the phone together. <laughs> doing exactly what we'd always done. And, and it would always conclude with, can't you please come to class from Jack? And I would always end with, I'd love to Jack, but you know, I'm with, it's the two days I'm with my husband. And so that was kind of the, you know, the way our, our uh, relationship uh, came to a conclusion. Jack uh, had a, a final stroke in 2005, and um, and the the um, uh, you know we we had a, uh, a, a you know a thank you very much you know uh, communication and uh, and and then he died and uh, and on the day of his funeral, I was, it was the day that I and my husband flew to uh, Texas because we were moving to Texas and we flew to, to buy a house. And so that was, um, you know, that was how things concluded with Jack. Uh, it became very clear to me that I, um, later it became even more clear what, uh, of how that whole thing worked and uh jack uh and and jack had apologized and explained to me that once once a sort of public perception happened that there that he was against the public spirituality that um that he couldn't get it turned around mm -hmm. um and um 
and I had arranged during that time, I had arranged for uh, Russian Planeta 4 to interview Jack. And at the interview, um, when the, when the uh, interviewer asked, you know, what is unique right off the bat, the first thing that Jack talked about was the spirituality of Michael Chekhov. And so this, uh, you know, I knew, we knew in our hearts together that, uh, that, that this was a truth and, um, you know. But I think that every teacher, every actor who deals uh, with this technique knows knows that. But I I mean it goes without saying. It, that's part of it. I mean you can't do it with with without it. Well, you know, when, when you listen to those audio tapes in particular and you hear him very specifically describe the uh, sense of the creative spirit, it's in his guiding principles and those guiding principles are part of the NMCA pedagogy, they're part of Nisha's pedagogy, um, to understand the, the nature of spirit, uh, he, he describes it in such detail in his writing and, and on the audio tapes that, uh, you know, at, in this era, in the 21st century, uh, my hope is that people are available and interested. And how much an individual chooses to engage in that is completely their creative individuality and how much any given teacher does is a, uh, again, their creative individuality as well. I do feel that historically, uh, because Michael Chekhov himself was severely persecuted, uh, the, the spiritual elements of it were uh, in large part why he was marked for arrest in Russia and, uh, and uh, escaped, emigrated, call it what you, what you will, um, and never to return to Russia um, in very large part because of the spiritual nature. And we see uh, emanating over the, the eras, you can see him decreasing in the public revelation. Uh -huh. um, in his own teaching, he stopped speaking about it. Uh, fortunately, Mala Powers as one person and Jack Colvin as another, who he worked with privately, they had at length discussions about it. And uh, Mala, Mala Powers said, you know, Big Pixie, you're hiding something from me. I need to know what you're hiding. And so he shared her, with her fully his uh, understandings of Steiner and other spiritual belief systems. And, uh, and Mala herself, herself became a devout anthroposophist, uh, you know, studying Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science. So, uh, but even she, like Jack, like uh, Joanna Merlin, who, who with me had a discussion in 1998 uh, that uh, for her it was not appropriate to bring spirit publicly into um, the revelation of Michael Chekhov's work. Uh, so this, uh, this feeling was carried by many people who were the first generation, the direct students of Michael Chekhov's. Um, so I do believe it was not their task to, to be fully public with it. And they, uh, Joanna and Mala and um, Jack in interviews that very clearly talk about the spiritual impact that Mr. Chekhov had on them very clearly. And so it's not that they don't know it and it's not that they're uh, unmoved by it. They were all very personally moved by it, but, but they upheld the policy that Mr. Chekhov himself had adopted uh, to protect himself. And so I feel uh, I, that it was not their task to, to bring that out. For myself, I do feel that it is my calling and I, and I support their individual choices and I support my own, of course. Uh, I, I wonder if, maybe it's very simplistic what I'm going to say, but I wonder if uh, 
you all talking about the same thing and thinks that the other person is talking about a different thing. I mean, everybody, um, each teacher defines for himself or for herself, for herself, what spirituality is. And maybe, um, I mean, for you, it's something uh, of this kind and for Joanna, it's something else. And, you know, it's like a, and I don't think that Joanna was in your class. Um, so maybe there's some kind of, because I worked with you for, you know, two years and I can say that I, it's there, but you never, you know, you never pushed anything. You never, so I, maybe it's only this thing that it's like misunderstanding. I don't know. It's maybe it's simplistic, but I, just offering an idea. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's very interesting. Um, and and I, I think there's probably a lot of veracity to it. Um, I'm going to pause for just one moment, Ophir, because I need to power in here. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, I do think that... Um, interpretation and understanding and on some to some degree for um, a lot of the objection was for the word spirit to be written in any publications in any public any advertising flyers promotion uh, that was uh, that was an objection that came and the, the uh, objections came about my references on my website uh, the people oh. to my website containing references of uh, the spiritual nature and um and that again it, uh, you know i i i think it there was an atmosphere around it and um then i feel confident that um much of that atmosphere has softened uh, very much so as as we've all grown more deeply into it and we see you know very um, undeniably how how it's there I would you know uh, that concept of the word is still uh, people are still frightened of it uh, and I understand from Sharon Carnegie who I consider to be one of the world's foremost authorities on Stanislavski as an English speaker. Uh, she was part of the Jean Benedetti, Anatoly Smelyansky trio that was assigned to or taking up the translation of what was going to be a 10 volume set of Stanislavski works. So we, they started working on this in the early 90s. Ultimately, it resulted with Jean Benedetti's own publication in 2008 of the what is supposed to be the definitive Stanislavski translations into English uh, based on this previously censored material from the Soviet and yet uh, Benedetti uh, and and why we don't know but we can say uh, but it is it is in, in print, it's quoted in my book, Murder of Talent, How Pop Culture's Killing It, uh, uh, from, I think it comes out of the Rutledge Stanislavski Companion, where Sharon Carnegie shows us how Stanislavski's own words, which he fought the Soviet Central Committee to retain, where he mm. used, anywhere where he used soul was changed to mind, and anywhere where he used spiritual was changed to mental. And this is 2008. So this, uh, somewhere in the field, there is still, uh, you know, a residue of this worry about uh, allowing the free connection of spirit to uh, to the artist, to the, to artistic creativity. And so it's, it, it was no me, by no means limited just to Mr. Chekhov's work. It was a cultural condition. And, um, so we just kind of look at that as, as what it is, but it is part of the reason why 
the National Michael Chekhov Association tagline is bringing the spirit of Michael Chekhov into the 21st century. So, yeah, yeah, there. Um, I'm going to wrap up this recording. So, yeah. so you answered me. <laughs> uh, them. Um, and now, yeah, I, I hope that sometime something will come up and, you know, written about him or something. I hope so too. And at least I hope to be able to get the, uh, the documentary interview uh, with oh, him. Oh, I hope. I, I wish. Yeah. I mean, you know that I have a very, uh, a very big desire to steal your, your uh, materials. <laughs> That's why this, I'm pouring them into you. <laughs> yeah, I, this is something that is very interest, interesting. Yeah, for me. All righty, signing off. Thank you. Thanks.